All right, next we'll prep the valve body for installation. So first things first, install your manual valve rod. And then get your feed pipe ready, get your feed pipe hold down bolt ready. The one that goes in the auxiliary valve body. And then we gotta install two check balls in the valve body itself. So I'll get those in and then I'll show you where they go. Here's your check ball locations. Got a check ball here and a check ball here. Since we're working with an auxiliary valve body unit, we do not put a check ball here. If you put a check ball here, you're gonna have some serious issues. Um, among those are uh, reverse, low reversal burn up, and you also have a tie up or bind up in uh, forward and or second. So between one and two. Non auxiliary valve body units take that check ball, but auxiliary valve body units do not. Okay, just uh, set the linkage arm into the manual valve and then carefully lower the valve body into position onto the case. Pretty straightforward. Just double check, make sure it's fully engaged. Otherwise, the vehicle won't go nowhere when the driver puts it in drive. Okay, there's your center bolt location. Okay, it's in. And just grab your feed pipe. Feed pipe may or may not go right in just by, you know, by hand, so you may have to persuade it in with a hammer and a screwdriver. Okay. All right, and then just the rest of your bolts. Let's get this here. And unlike the 4LCTEs, you don't have to install the wiring harness and TC solenoid before you install the main valve body as there's nothing obstructing uh, these two bolts. I don't know if it was actually upside down, I just felt weird. Okay, like I said, low power. All right, let's see if I can torque these bolts up without moving this thing all over the place. Just gonna kinda get some good leverage on it. Oops.
98 inch pounds all the way around. So I just start from the middle and just work my way out in, you know, more or less a quasi spiral like pattern. I mean, you don't necessarily have to follow that. I mean, as far as I know, there's no um, torque order for these bolts, but it's just out of habit, I guess, more or less than anything else. Main thing is you want to avoid stripping these bolts. Strip bolts equals cross leaks in most circumstances. I already got that one. Now we'll do the wiring harness, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, and if I can, I'll do a separate video on one of these in the future so that you can see the uh, setup in more detail. So here it is, pretty simple harness. It's got a main case connector that contains four terminals. Terminal A, B, C, and D. And then we have our new TCC solenoid. This is a Fitzall and it comes with these little handy dandy connectors and the TCI kit comes with them too. So, you know, if you buy these two things, you'll have two extras. So solenoid A, uh, excuse me, terminal A, the wire that comes out of there is hooked into the power wire on the solenoid. Okay. I don't know if you could see that real clearly. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's a tangled rat's nest, but solenoid B, that has a loose end, and that will go into the solenoid ground. And then you have your two connectors for the dual prong pressure switch that we installed in lieu of the factory single prong switch for the fourth clutch. And then, of course, you plug this into the main case connector. So you cannot use the TCI kit with a single wire TCC solenoid. You gotta use a dual wire. And I mean, they're not that expensive. I think this was like 20 bucks or something like that. Maybe 25 bucks. So. So you're going to use the same factory 10 millimeter bolts. If you're working on 204R, because this, um, both the lockup kit and the solenoid are compatible with both transmissions. If you're working for, uh, working on a 204R, the kit comes with these uh, stud and nut combos that you're going to use um, in conjunction with that transmission but you're not going to use it with this one. And the same 98 inch pounds.
And then you're just going to snake the wires underneath so that you can route them cleanly. So this little engagement tab here just goes, um, you know, coincides with the uh, female tab on the case connector. So they do leave you a lot of slack. So what I'm gonna do is, once I have these two connected, I'm gonna clean this up a little bit. And it doesn't matter which one of these goes to which one, uh, it doesn't specify. So, however you can plug them in, that's how they'll go. All right, give me a minute to tidy that up and then we'll resume. All right, it's a little cleaner. Main thing to keep in mind with these aftermarket harnesses is they do tend to give you um, plenty of slack, a little too much sometimes. Um, the main thing is you want to keep the harness away from any moving parts. So uh, where it's gonna be most vulnerable is around here where it goes into the case connector because you have your, um, you know, your shift linkage and your parking rod and uh, particularly the little spring on the end of that rod, you don't want the wire to get caught up in there. So you want to keep it away from uh, the rod so that it does not get snagged. And then the other thing is you don't want it to interfere with the filter either. So you want that filter to lay on top nice and flush. Okay, speaking of the filter, it's time to put it on. Little assembly lube in the uh, pickup area. And then on the seal itself. Now, if you have to take this filter out again for any reason, the seal's gonna stay behind, um, or at least chances are it will. So that's fine, no big deal. Just something to be aware of, that's all. So for pan gaskets, uh, I do not like, oh, sorry about that, I do not like the rubber gaskets. Uh, they tend to leak if you over tighten them or you don't tighten them just right. Uh, I should say you under tighten them, they'll leak. Even they'll leak if you do everything right. So I would avoid them if you can. And. RTV is not a solution either. You don't want to ever put RTV on the on the pan. If the pan consistently leaks and you know you torque all your bolts to spec and everything is um, done correctly, then the pan is likely warped. The sealing surfaces are no longer any good, and you'll need to replace the pan. Okay, just do a quick check on your bench. Make sure there's no parts that are sitting on the bench that should be bolted onto the underside of the case. Um, I mean, you should be doing that periodically throughout. Uh, and again, um, I would be a hypocrite if I said I never made mistakes. Um, you know, I've left all kinds of stuff on the bench before. An overwhelming majority of the time I've caught it, but you know, still it happens. But you know, just double check. Better be safe than sorry. Make sure you have a magnet. And then all these bolts get 98 inch pounds. You don't need any kind of fastener lube on these bolts. You just install them dry and torque them up. It's not like an engine or anything like that. 
you know, no, no thread sealer of any kind, just, uh, you know, the bolt, just make sure the threads are clean, make sure the threads are clean on the case, and you should be fine. The only thing is it just takes a minute or two to get them all in. Let's see if I can speed this up a little bit. And then as far as tightening sequence, again, I don't believe that either the factory service manuals or ATSG call for anything specific, but I will generally tighten here in the middle with these three bolts and then just work my way to the ends. And, you know, same with the torque, you know, middle and then ends. Just make sure you have them all in before you start zipping them down. Thirteen millimeter. thing is with all pan gaskets, if you, even if you torque them all the way up on the first pass, the, the gasket still has to compress. So more than likely you're going to have to go around at least twice. So just be mindful of that. I mean, if you don't, I don't know that it'll leak, but at the same time, they, you know, they won't be at the, at the torque that you specified. You still be a little give. I already did that one and it took a good deal more torque to get back to 98.
Now, if you feel one of these bolts start to strip, it's gonna be your call whether or not you wanna do anything about it. If any of the bolts, you know, that, you know, maybe uh, not taking full torque or, um, you know, either this one or this one or any further to the rear, then I would pull the pan off and, um, you know, do the best you can to mask everything else off and then install a halo coil kit. In my experience, if they're forward of that and they're still taking maybe like 70 or 80 uh, inch pounds, then it's up to you. Uh, but those have not proven to leak. If you're doing this for somebody else, you may want to make them aware of that so that uh, they know that they may need to install a heel coil or offer to do it for them if you discover it on the day that they're due to pick up the unit and you don't have time to, to fix it between you know when you discover it and when they're due to arrive. All right, I think we're good on pan bolt torque. So I need a new marker. I always like to write the uh, torque on the bottom of the pan so that, you know, if the owner or whomever has to service this thing at some point in the future, then, you know, I mean, if nothing else, it's on my paperwork too, but if for whatever reason they lose that, and you know, maybe that'll survive and they have that. All right. So, just a few things left to do. Um, we got to figure out that situation with respect to the extension housing bushing. And between the time I filmed that bushing segment and now, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to really do anything um, you know, else with it. In other words, I looked around, did not have another extension housing that I could just throw on. So um, I'm just going to run with that, you know, that bushing in there. I mean, that's not something I'd normally ever advise, but um, you know, I'll, you know, this isn't a, a and, you know, something that's going to go back on the road tomorrow or anything like that. So uh, I'll make the owner aware. And, you know, if I find something between now and then, then I'll set it up. And, you know, we can just swap extension housings before he goes back together, uh, you know, with it in the vehicle. So that's kind of how we'll have to play that. I mean, no big deal. Uh, you know, I'll pay for the extension housing and whatnot. And, you know, I don't know if it's a problem with this housing specifically or if it's, um, you know, just bushings that are not... To spec or even maybe it's my yoke but i don't think it's my yoke because I tested that yoke and god knows how many of these bushings and the same extension housings the same bushings and uh you know i've never had that issue so or at least i can't remember the last time i did have it i think i had it maybe once before and the housing ended up not being any good so maybe that's the case with this one who knows all right, I'm gonna get this thing off the fixture and then uh, you know, we'll go ahead and finish it up. So, extension housing. Make sure you have your square cut seal there on the sealing surface. And just slide it on over. Four bolts, um, 15 millimeter install. The first three, leave this one out so that you can get your speedometer housing in there. All right, that's right, these bolts were, were a little hard coming out. So,
Even with bolts like this, I would only use the uh, little quarter inch drive impact. Last thing I need is, uh, you know, a stripped extension housing thread on the case. And, you know, when it comes to transmissions, you never know when bad luck will strike or bird ball will get thrown at you. So you try to do the best you can to mitigate that and prevent it from happening. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna put the original um, the original speed sensor back in. Uh, this man has a uh, Dakota Digital or a similar setup, and he has his own speed sensor that's going to go in here. So uh, the only thing this thing's really going to be doing is just preventing, you know, outside elements from getting in. So you know what? I actually put this in. I was thinking of something else. I don't know what I was thinking of there. Okay, here's a speed sensor. And this just took a 10 millimeter bolt. That is if I can get it started. Like I said, this will be coming out fairly soon or whenever he's ready to go and deal with it. millimeter on this nut at nine sixteenths. Now the socket I use to install the sucker shaft seal. Okay, so this little bolt here, this 10 millimeter, this goes um, this goes over here for your TV cable. So I'm not going to install that now. I'll let him deal with that when the time comes. But there's a new TV cable. Always buy a new one. And then one more thing. So right here is your line pressure tap or port. When you go to put this thing back in, when you sit up and adjust your TV cable, you're gonna screw in a transmission pressure gauge here and you're gonna use that to make adjustments to your you know to the tension on your cable uh, the geometry has to be correct the cable tension has to be correct and while I have not done one of these in forever um, just at a high level um, what you want to do is when you have the cable preliminarily adjusted you want to have somebody else sit in the front seat and put their um, foot to the pe to the gas pedal all the way to the floor and then do your final adjustment it has to be tight not super tight, but tight when that when that accelerator is on the floor. 
Otherwise, your readings will never be correct. You'll have insufficient line pressure and line rise, and you might risk burning up the transmission. Um, particularly the 3 4 clutch pack. Like I said, that's really what's very vulnerable. Although, if uh, the cable's driven either disconnected or it snaps, or you know, it's so poorly adjusted, it might as well have not been there at all, then you could also burn up your forwards and your band. All right, I think I'm gonna wrap it up here. Uh, overall, uh, the build went fairly well. Um, yeah, I say fairly well because there was a couple curveballs that were thrown our way, but you know, we dealt with them. Uh, I mean, that's transmission building in a nutshell. Uh, not every build is gonna go smooth. Um, you, you know, going to encounter a problem here, a problem there, you know, sometimes big, sometimes small, but you know, it's just, uh, Things you can do up front to mitigate the risk of either delays or being just, you know, totally, uh, um, you know, without, uh, you know, without a solution to a problem, uh, you know, things you can do up front to plan. Uh, so for folks just getting into transmission building, my advice would be that whatever unit you're working on, um, you know, make sure that uh, you research the procedures, uh, you know, extensively. Uh, watching a video series like this should give you a really good idea as to what's involved in building one of these as well as uh, some of the things that you might run into that, you know, could uh, pose a challenge, you know, there on the spot. So things like clutch clearances, you know, um, make sure that you have a good understanding of what's selective in terms of either, um, you know, steel plates or pressure plates or snap rings and, and the like. Um, the other thing I would advise is, uh, you know, have redundancies, uh, you know, have uh, spare bushing kits, uh, especially if you're doing bushings for your, um, you know, your first build for the first time. It's very easy to, you know, break a bushing. So I would, if you're building one of these transmissions, I would just buy two complete bushing kits. And if you don't need the other one, then, you know, you can take it back, but, uh, or send it back. But that's what I would do. And at least that'll prevent, you know, delays and, and, um, you know, other issues from popping up, uh, for the three, four pack. Um, you know, again, I would keep a few extra steels of different thicknesses around so that if you're either too loose or too tight, you know, you can swap the steels in real quick and, you know, get the clearance you need. So anyway, uh, that's the 700R4. Uh, this has been a mild slash, you know, maybe classify this as mild to moderate. Uh, it is certainly not high performance or, or particularly heavy duty. However, for what it's being built for in the application, it's gonna be more than suitable for that. Uh, I am hoping to get in another 700R4 pretty soon. I've been talking to somebody about um, wanting to do like a street strip type deal where he wants to take it to the track and you know, it's gonna go behind a 383. So if I get that one in, that'll be a uh, full on high performance build and I'll film that in its entirety so that uh, you can see the differences between how I, you know, set one of these up for just a stock or a cruiser or whatever, and then um, how I would set it up for high performance race or, you know, real heavy duty extreme type use. All right. So once again, thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them below. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day and we will see you on the next build.